I am enthusiastic, writes Bucky Fuller, the opening of Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, over humanity's extraordinary and sometimes very timely ingenuities. Now, something Mr. Fuller did not see coming was the wonder that his slow-cooked, slow-simmered kettle and fire bone broth stuff will get you going. And here it is, autumn. We're in the midst of it. It's a warmer autumn than usual, but still cool in a lot of places. And it's soup weather. Get yourself some bone broth to be a base for your soup, or just get some soup straight from Kettle and Fire. A lot of it's keto-friendly, help with your intermittent fasting, and it's just darn delicious. Save 10% on your order by going to Kettle and Fire and using code BETTERHUMANHOOD at checkout. That's Kettle and Fire, K-E-T-T-L-E-A-N-D-F-I-R-E dot com. Fill up your box, use code BETTERHUMANHOOD at checkout for 10% off. Let's do the show. Welcome to Better Humanhood, where we build a better world by building better people. We have to live on the planet and we have to live with other people. We have conversations about making that a wonderful proposition. In the opening pages of Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, Buckminster Fuller praises human ingenuity, but he decries our laziness. He praises our ingenuity, says we're being a little too lazy. By the way, I hope you're doing awesome right now. Hope that this moment in time finds you in a spectacular mood. I hope you're getting some fresh air, walking, or maybe maybe we're passing a little time during some downtime at work. If you're in a shipwreck, though, writes Fuller, and a piano top happens to be floating by, it'll make a great substitute for a life raft. That's good ingenuity. But, he continues, but... Think that we are clinging to a great many piano tops, accepting yesterday's fortuitous contrivings as constituting the only means for solving a given problem. In other words, that's how we've always done it. It's not a good excuse. And Fuller's writing in the 1960s, by the way, so as we quote him throughout this episode, understand that even though some of his observations seem current, they were made over a half century ago. And his point here is that when a problem we hadn't foreseen shows up, we create a duct tape and band-aid solution for it. It works well enough, and that just becomes the solution. We don't actually sit down and consider what the best solution might be. Far be it from us to look forward and come up with a good solution for a problem we know is coming down the road, but when it shows up, it'll be someone else's problem. Think global food shortages. Fuller was already worried about overpopulation 50 years ago when the world's population was less than half of what it is now. In fact, if you want to see how the world evolves, go search Josh Shear 50 years. We roll back 50 years at a time and just look at the vast differences that happen in people's lifetimes. Anyway, we have problems. Some of them are global, some of them are in our houses, some of them, and I'm talking around the house here, have old proven solutions. A little bit of spackle and a touch of paint seems to be a good solution to a nail hole in the drywall. Some could innovate, and some could benefit from some innovation. Roof shingles, for instance, at least here in the U.S., often need to be replaced every 25 or 30 years. Couldn't we do better? especially if our houses last for centuries otherwise. Then there's everyday life. Lots of municipalities, even in the U.S., have unsafe drinking water. You solve a problem like that in a developing country, like the good people at Fight for the, at Fight for the Forgotten do, and you start solving world problems. Solve it in the U.S., you free up the court system, stop dumping plastics in the ocean, and cut down on cancer cases. It's expensive to replace sewer systems, stop combined sewer overflows, and replace lead-lined pipes in aging buildings. 
But perhaps there's an innovative solution we're missing beyond suing schools for bottled water like residents had to do in Flint, Michigan. Because yesterday's negatives were moved out of sight from their familiar locations, Fuller writes, many people are willing to pretend to themselves that the problems have been solved. They haven't. They've just been moved out of sight. I mentioned combined sewer overflows, and I don't know if you're familiar with what that means, but many U.S. municipalities, when they were built, when they were first building sewer systems through them, they wound up just emptying into rivers. So if rainwater and toilet water and bath water all ended up overflowing the system, it just diverted, went into a local river, which often was a source of food, fish, and then later the animals we hunt or even that we farm would drink out of that river and get sick. And our bodies of water became unswimmable, undrinkable. And in order to fix this, it turns out it's millions and sometimes billion dollars, billions of dollars worth of work. It's crazy. I was When I was starting out as a reporter, 1999-2000, cities in western Massachusetts were behind the curve trying to fix these issues. They were supposed to be fixed by the mid-90s. And some cities throughout the country, they're still trying to fix their combined sewer overflow issues. That's looking ahead to the future. What can be a problem and what's going to be very difficult to fix with duct tape and band-aids. This is, of course, the second part of a four-part series on creativity. And creativity, writes Mihai Chixit Mihai in a book of that name, is essential to our lives for two reasons. One, the things that are most important and interesting in our lives are the results of creativity. And two, when we are involved in creativity... We feel that we are living more fully. In Chixit Mihai's assessment, we're generally going to be happier if we're doing creative things. And on top of that, if you're going to be involved in something important or interesting, I think most of us are striving for that in our lives, you're probably going to do so by being involved in something creative. Now, creative work can be innovative solutions to tough problems. And that can be from an engineering standpoint from a plumbing standpoint, which is engineering, really. It can be artistic. It can be a new way to fly. Remember that creativity is not relegated to the arts. Further, Chicks at Mihai writes, problems are solved only when we throw attention and creativity at them. If living a life doing important, fulfilling things that makes us happy and solves the world's problem isn't enough of an argument for practicing some creativity, consider that creativity could save your life. Alan G. Robinson and Sam Stern write about a psychologist named Paul Torrance, who worked with the U.S. Air Force during the Korean War. And what he discovered is that it didn't matter how extensive someone's training was. When faced with a life-or-death situation, there were always unexpected factors that couldn't be trained. The deciding factor for surviving is creativity. It's creative problem solving. How do I avoid this situation we hadn't planned for and therefore hadn't trained for? And we'll talk a lot more about the problems with specialization in the fourth part of this series, which will deal with prescriptions for being more creative. While there's certainly something to be said for being the best at one thing, being able to bounce between endeavors and have more generalized knowledge can really propel you in getting ahead. Fuller and Chixent Mihai both write about this a fair bit, almost two generations apart. Fuller perhaps drives the point home a little harder by noting it was the great pirates who ran the world. They were the ones who held the puppet strings on kings and other regional leaders because they were the ones who could deliver food and goods in abundance. They knew enough about farming and food preservation and sailing and just a little bit of Everything. The men who were able to establish themselves on the oceans, he writes, had also to be extraordinarily effective with the sword upon both land and sea. They had also to have great anticipatory vision, 
great ship design and capability, and original scientific conception. Mathematical skill and navigation and exploration techniques for coping in fog, night, and storm with the invisible hazards of rocks, shoals, and currents. The great sea venturers had to be able to command all the people in their dry realm in order to commandeer the adequate metal washing, woodworking, weaving, and other skills necessary to produce their large, complex ships. Those great pirates had to know a lot about a lot in order to maintain their positions. I was born in 1976. I graduated high school in 1994. My junior and senior years, we had a school intranet. We were in certain classrooms. We were able to carry out a text chat with friends within the building. When I got to college, I first saw the internet. There were message boards and some text-only websites, and you could link to a file like a picture that would take minutes, sometimes many minutes, to download. Five years later, the internet was widespread in home, thanks in large part to free AOL CDs. Some people had second phone lines dedicated to internet access, and a few people had DSL, which ran through a phone line. Businesses were starting to go bust because they had banked on everyone having high-speed internet access by the late 90s. Amazon, which at the beginning was just an online bookstore, timed it right. Yahoo had just enough cash tucked away to hang on. Here we are 20 years after that. We're carrying high-speed internet in our pockets. We don't even need to wire them to anything. We can get high-speed internet just wandering around town. Many people have dumped TV altogether in favor of streaming services. And then there's automation. It used to take hundreds of people to build train tracks. Now there are a couple of people operating a machine. One person can cut, strip, section, and stack lumber in seconds. Presidential candidate Andrew Yang looks ahead and sees a near future in which 8 million people who drove trucks or worked at truck stops are out of jobs because of self-driving vehicles. Things are moving very fast, and that's new. It was millennia between when we figured out fire and invented the wheel. More millennia passed from the wheel to the printing press. A mere centuries passed from the printing press to the Industrial Revolution, and mere decades from the telegraph to radio to television. Henry Ford said that if you asked people what they had wanted, they would have told you a faster horse. Cities used to have a horse waste problem toward the end of the 19th century. There were so many horses involved in transportation, they couldn't get the streets clean fast enough. So people went on the hunt for a better pooper scooper. But you know what gets rid of horse dung better? Cars. Not because they're out scooping up horse shit, but because they're faster and don't eat as much. People didn't need their horses anymore. Things used to move and change very slowly, waiting for a creative thinker like a Henry Ford, like the Wright brothers, wasn't otherwise occupied with trying to keep everybody alive day to day. Now there are a lot of people involved in creative thinking. You know, our friend Elkanon Goldberg, who we quoted extensively last week, writes, in an informationally stagnant society where change previously occurred at a glacial rate, Relatively few individuals were engaged in creative processes. But in a society where knowledge and skills become obsolete even before they become routine, virtually every member of society becomes part of the creative process. It doesn't matter if you want to be part of the creative machine. You are in it. Getting through your day often involves creative decisions that not only didn't our parents have to make when they were, they were our age, but also that no one would have even conceived of a decade and a half ago. In an environment characterized by such a rate of change, he continues, a major redeployment of neural resources may be necessary in any individual brain. A major change in the way the human brain processes information. Like, we're not going to consciously change the human brain in in our lifetimes, probably, but there's an evolution coming. Our brains will look different thanks to where we're going. Now let's go back a half century again to Fuller. He wrote in the wake of Eisenhower's warning of a military-industrial complex. Warning which, by the way, at the time seemed wingnut crazy, but is now an obvious daily reality. I mean, think about it. Most of the devices or carry items or most of us use or carry or wear 
things every day that at one time were designed for the military, even if we don't think about it, including, by the way, internet access, including driving on interstate highways. Here's Fuller decrying the use of combined knowledge and creative output primarily for military purposes. The the potentially integratable techno-economic advantage accruing to society from the myriad specializations are not comprehended integratively and therefore are not realized, or they are realized in only negative ways in new weaponry or the industrial support only of warfaring. Basis for the internet was the Department of the Defense Program. We build things for the military, again, like the interstate, and then alter them for use in civilian life. But the real work comes in altering it creatively. At some point, we went from email and discussion boards to online stores, gambling, social media, and streaming audio and video, and really it feels like it happened overnight. Here's the punchline. I know I've been talking for a while now. The important work and the important life are creative. Go out and practice creativity. We're going to talk more about that in both parts three and four of this series, but go out and practice creativity because it's a skill, not a talent, and you can hone it. Now go. Be who you are. Be who you will to be. Get yourself 10% off Kettle and Fire Bone Broth by visiting kettleandfire.com. Fill up your box. Use cut that again. Check out. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Get show notes and more at betterhumanhood.com. Leave us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you.